Cause the earth is still and just don't move Horizons that are level and flat Stars show no stellar parallax Michelson, Morley, Sagdad and Gale The famous series experiment failed The earth is the center of the universe Bury the truth and the things get worse Nassau nearly takes the lead Bill that science guy shares his creed Groaning's less a magic crew Be sure they're Satan's children too Jesuits and Masons rule Tesla's energy was new, then World War I and World War II And what did Admiral Burgo do? I took first and then on two And I took the Nazi troops with the ships and planes and cascadoos And what did they find? We don't know Some say German, some say snow Some say that they reached the wall of a glass dome that's way too tall But even though many of us are needy They blocked us all with the end of the treaty Back to Project Paperclip is Nazi scientists UFOs in Area 51 Where all the secret tests are done Yeah, yeah, yeah They start a project fishbowl They try to make a great big hole in the firmament That's way up high Planes and bombs they try and try False flags pretend terrorists Are actors that just don't exist And fake cold wars and nuclear wars TV tells us how Duck and cover, take your little pill Nassau's proven exactly nil No Russia, U.S. space race Debunkers make too good of a case How come I can see way past the curve? Eh? I mean way past Yeah Incoming asteroids Could it be Earth? We'd be destroyed We'd be destroyed One big sun flare That's all she wrote And Obama, they just both went on Jimmy Kimball's late night TV show They mention secret files and make a note The flat earth changed, aliens disclose Yeah, yeah, yeah Now aliens will have to wait Sphere versus flat debate The more of us who know the earth isn't round We'll make this house of cards fall down Careful what you wish for, friend The flat earth reveal is not the end This system, it just has to crash New world order from the end The next step of the evil plan Is to make you take the mark in your head or your hand I know that it's a real low blow They got the money in your mind And now they want your soul Big bang Random life everywhere Evolution Where's God? Where's God? Aristotle, Copernicus, Newton, Einstein, and the rest. Even Aristophanes was wrong. Now you've heard this amazing song. Folks, love each other, would you? And remember that God loves you very much. And we'll talk soon. When I first heard this flat earth subject, I dismissed it without even giving it a second thought. But more recently, at the beginning of 2015, I ran across a few flat earth videos again. And while looking into the fake moon photos circulating around, I saw that people were claiming that the images from earth from space were fake as well. Pretty soon the flat earth subject became viral online. And after looking at the Apollo missions one night and coming to the conclusion that they were nothing more than a huge con game, it jarred my memory about something. And for a very specific reason, I decided to look deeply into the Flat Earth without just dismissing it blindly as so many do. Why did I look into it this time? Well, I do pray for knowledge and wisdom and discernment. But maybe the recent Apollo footage I watched helped. However, I live near a very large lake, Lake Ontario. And I happen to remember going to the beach as a kid and looking across the lake and seeing New York State coast off in the distance. I never ever thought anything about it ever, except I remember it being there when I went to the beach. Now, I've been to that beach a hundred times over the years. And once this topic gained more prominence in early 2015, the first video I saw explained the curvature of the Earth and what it's supposed to be in inches per mile. 
And it resonated with me because I remember that I could see clear across the lake to the other coast, something that broke all the sphere earth rules. So with NASA fakery on my mind and the memory of seeing this coastline that supposedly was too far below the horizon for me to be able to see it due to the curvature of the Earth, I re-examined the Flat Earth Theory. And as unbelievable as it seemed, it started to make a lot of sense, especially since I did distinctly remember being able to see that far coast basically any time I was at my local beach. And as I've said, I've been there hundreds of times over the years. But even so, I went back to the beach recently and stood at the shore. I looked south and guess what? I could see the New York State coastline just like I remember. Now I googled the distance and it was approximately 36 miles. I learned what the curvature of the Earth is supposed to be exactly at that distance. And according to the people that believe in the sphere, and I found out that the coast should have been buried below my ability to see it by almost 900 feet. That part of the New York State coast had a top elevation of less than 300 feet. So that left at least a huge 600 foot discrepancy. And even more because I could see some of the height of the far shore. Was something really wrong with the reality that they've been selling us ever since we were born? Well, I ended up becoming a little fixated on proving or disproving the concept. And at first, I truly thought disproving the flat earth would be rather easy. I thought there had to be a reasonable explanation why I could see so far beyond the so-called curved barrier. I learned about light refraction and superior mirages. I learned about perspective and horizons. I learned about how our eyes work. I viewed dozens of similar experiences on YouTube. I listened to experts and people who thought they had logical but spherical explanations. In fact, I tried for a few months to debunk the concept and just couldn't. The more I looked into it, the more sense it made and the less likely that the sphere model we've been spoon-fed since birth was a reality. It's just flat out wrong. And as more people shared their experiences and proofs online, it only added to my growing, pretty much unwavering belief that the world is not what we've been told. And learning about how our eyes work and how perspective work helps a lot with understanding sunrises and sunsets and ships disappearing hull first at sea and other supposed sphere earth proofs. I can't say for certain what shape the earth is or how big it is, or if there's an Antarctic ring or a barrier beyond it, or if it's an infinite plane. Maybe everything we theorize is not complete. There are so many possibilities that it blows the mind. And the flat earth has no real complete standard model because it's all based on us finding out things for ourselves. We agree on the facts and certain basics, but the rest is only hypothetical even if it seemingly makes sense. And as the evidence mounts for both the flat earth and against the sphere, I wanted to create a special place where folks can learn and share what they've learned with other supporters. Differences of opinion are certainly going to come forth and should be expressed openly. But remember that the goal of my videos and their corresponding threads is to provide the opportunity to use each of us to learn and grow in any area that any of us has a problem in. If there is a thing you can't understand, then ask. Someone will have an opinion and we can go from there. If you have a point to make against what is considered an accepted flat earth fact, please provide any relevant links or supporting proofs or videos. I am currently under the impression that the entire space program, even the low Earth orbit and all that is there, is really just a sleight of hand trick by a group of illusionists that have swindled the public, the governments of the world, the media, and us into believing a lie. Everybody, a small group of corporations and cabals have almost complete control over the entire financial, educational, high-level governmental and media systems, leaving it up to real armchair scientists and normal people that can critically think and recreate experiments themselves to independently prove or disprove prove any accepted line of thought about our reality. Look, I ain't the smartest man on the flat earth, but I ain't no dummy. I'm educated, and I never ever questioned or ever thought of an alternative to a sphere earth until this year. It never entered my mind to question this part of our reality at all, ever. But now I question everything. I'm a Christian, and I think I see the big picture. Thanks, Thanks for watching my video. If you'd like to see more proof against the heliocentric model and proof against the sphere, then make sure to subscribe to my channel. And if there's anything you disagree with, Make sure you leave a note below explaining exactly why. Remember, folks, follow the golden rule. God loves you. We'll talk soon.
normalmente produzco solo videos en inglés y español. Normally I produce only videos in English and Spanish. Normalerweise produziere ich nur videos in English and Spanish. Pero hoy voy a hacer otra excepción y traducirlo también en alemán. But today I make another exception and translate it into German too. Aber heute werde ich nochmal eine Ausnahme machen und es auch in Deutsch übersetzen. Ya algunas semanas tengo escrito en mi lista de tareas por hacer de traducir el video hashtag BTC4. Now already some weeks ago I have written on my to-do list to translate the video BTC4, hashtag BTC4. Schon seit ein paar Wochen habe ich äh, auf meiner To-Do-Liste geschrieben, ähm, den Video BTC4 in Deutsch zu übersetzen. Estoy segura que esta idea puede ayudar a mucha gente económicamente. I am sure that this can help many people economically. Ich bin sicher, dass diese Idee vielen Leuten äh, finanziell helfen kann. Y da motivación para aprender Bitcoin. And give motivation to learn about Bitcoin. Und motivation geben, um über Bitcoin zu lernen. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy bajo, económico. At the moment the price of Bitcoin is very low, economic. Im moment ist der Preis von Bitcoin sehr tief. Sería el momento ideal para invertir. Hoy es el 15 de abril 2015 would be the ideal moment to invest. Today is April 15th, 2015. Es wäre der ideale Moment zu investieren. Heute ist der 15. April 2015. El 27 de marzo 2015 he publicado en mi canal de YouTube Vanos Enigma el primer video sobre hashtag BTC4 explicando cómo me vino esta idea. On March 27th of 2015, um, I published my for the first video about hashtag BTC4 in my channel YouTube Vanos Enigma, explaining how I got the idea. Am 27. März 2015 habe ich in meinem YouTube-Channel Manus Enigma den ersten, den ersten Video über Hashtag BTC4 veröffentlicht und äh, erzählt, erklärt, wie ich diese Idee bekommen habe. La idea consiste principalmente en lo siguiente. The idea mainly consists in the following. Die idea besteht hauptsächlich en folgendem. folgendem. Imprimir en direcciones de Bitcoin en papel. Diez o... Mínimo diez o... Mejor cien. To print Bitcoin directions in paper, at least 10 or better 100. 
Bitcoin-Adressen in Papier ausdrucken, ähm, wenn ich mal 10 oder besser gleich 100, y luego poner en cada dirección de Bitcoin una pequeña cantidad de Bitcoin. And then put in every Bitcoin direction a little amount of Bitcoin. Und dann in jede Bitcoin Adresse eine kleine Summe von Bitcoin transferieren. Y la próxima vez, cuando otra vez ves una persona por la calle pidiendo dinero, And the next time uh, you see again a person begging for money on the street. Und das nächste Mal, wenn du wieder eine Person auf der Straße betteln siehst. Y para tus amigos y amigas. And for your friends, of course. Und für deine Freunde natürlich. O tal vez eh, de propina en un restaurante. Or maybe a tip in a restaurant. Oder trinkgeld im restaurant. Bueno, a la hora de imprimir también copiar y guardar las llaves privadas de Bitcoin. De direcciones de Bitcoin. Or when you print the Bitcoin addresses, um, copy and save the private keys of the Bitcoin addresses, of course. Wenn man die Bitcoin Adressen druckt, auch die, uh, auch die privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Address Schlüsseln, um, kopieren und speichern. Y a la hora de distribuir las direcciones de Bitcoin, escribir la fecha, por ejemplo, hoy es el 15 de abril 2015, escribir la fecha más plus cuatro años, eh, igual 15 de abril 2019. And then in the moment when you distribute uh, the Bitcoin addresses, you write the date, for example, today, April 15th, 2015, plus, plus four years uh, is April 15th, 2019. Und dann in dem Moment, wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen verteilt, auf das Papier schreiben, das heutige Datum, zum Beispiel 15. April 2015, plus vier Jahre ist gleich 15.04.2019. Luego vas a explicar a la gente, mira, esta es la llave privada. Tú y yo la tengo, la tienes. Si no quitas, transfieres este dinero de Bitcoin eh, en estos cuatro años, yo lo vuelvo a tener. Tener o sacar. Then you explain to the people, look, this is the private key. I have it and you have it. If you don't take this money, Bitcoin, out of this account, I will take it out in this, um, in these four years, at the end of these four years. Und dann erklärst du den Leuten, schau, das ist der private Schlüssel. Um, ich und du haben diesen privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Schlüssel. Wenn du bis Ende dieser vier Jahre das Geld Bitcoin nicht raus tust, transfer, dann hole ich es zurück. De esta forma das más motivación a la gente para empezar a aprender cómo funciona Bitcoin. This way you give more motivation to the people to learn how the technology of Bitcoin functions. 
auf diese Weise gibst du mehr Motivation den Leuten zu lernen, wie die Technologie von Bitcoin funktioniert. In mi video antigen Please, won't you be my neighbor? Well, hello, neighbor. You're watching The Daily Decrypt, episode 30. I'm Amanda B. Johnson, your host. Today, Bitcoin is $331. Made safe coin is two cents. Counterparty is 90 cents, and the supernet is $1.18. And today's episode is brought to you by Telebit. A new BitTorrent client that uses incentives to make file sharing faster and profitable is now available and it's called Joystream. So Joystream lets leechers send Bitcoin micropayments to seeders in order to make file sharing so quickly that it would ideally reach streaming level speeds. Joystream is available on all operating systems and if you would like to learn more about it, there is a discussion group going on in Zapchain. You may have heard of Dash, which is a cryptocurrency we've mentioned here on the Daily Decrypt a few times, most especially regarding masternodes. And in case you're wondering what masternodes means or how all of it works, like for example, Darksend, which is how masternodes anonymize Dash payments, or Instant X, which is how masternodes can guarantee almost instantaneous confirmations. Dash has been kind enough to put out this video series, which you may find educational in case you were curious. And I just like when people put out videos uh, to replace the sort of like, oh, here's a 20 page long wiki that we have written here that you will never read because it's boring and dry. So if you were ever curious, as some people are, in that Dash masternodes get paid, there you go. Have you ever heard of Wolfram Alpha? It's very cool. So I have used Wolfram Alpha just to generate QR codes for payment addresses, right? And so I've just typed in the address, like for example, my Bitcoin tip address, like here, and then QR and then code, and I press enter and voila bazam, it makes a QR code for me. But I just discovered today that you can do a lot more than make QR codes on Wolfram Alpha. It calls itself a computational knowledge engine, which is apparently uh, markedly different from like a search engine. And you just plug in questions that you have and it uses like special things to give you answers. For example, about things like chemistry and history and math and physics and even games and all of these things. And so if you are a data head which I suspect some of you might be, I think you would get a never-ending braingasm by visiting Wolfram Alpha, so I just wanted to tell you about it. There is a government-run television channel in the Netherlands called VPRO, and earlier this month they released a 50-minute documentary called The Gospel of Bitcoin. And I've seen a clip of it, and the clip was to my liking, but I hear from a lot of others who have, who have watched the full thing, that it is definitely worth a watch. Uh, apparently it features Roger Veer, Bitcoin Jesus quite a lot, but unlike a lot of other crypto documentaries, it also features interviews with people who think that Bitcoin is the devil. And so it's supposed to make for an interesting sort of, you know, counter argument asks the viewer, who's more credible, that sort of thing. And so if you were looking for a documentary to curl up with this weekend, there you go. How annoying is it when the weather forecaster tells you to expect rain and you cancel your tailgate party or your beach party or whatever and then it doesn't rain? Could more accurate weather predictions be made if people predicting that weather had to put their money where their mouth is? Maybe. And the gambling site WebBet is betting on it. 
WebBet is a place where you can gamble Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Dogecoin to make weather predictions for any of 5,000 plus cities across the globe. And if you're right, you get paid. And so I am seeing, I have a flash vision of a future in which a site like WebBet is potentially more accurate in predicting the weather than some clickbaity website like weather.com or something. We recently received a tip in Monero from Twitter Leo Treasure. Hey, thanks, Leo. And out of curiosity, we went to the Monero blockchain to see what our tip looked like on the blockchain, right? Because like I've told you already, Monero uses crypto note and view keys to like do all of these things where it obscures transactions on the blockchain. But I was like, I've never even looked at the Monero blockchain. I should look at it. And so I plugged my payment address into MoneroBlocks.eu and it tell, it gives me an error. Like it cannot, it, they don't, you, you cannot search people's transaction histories by addresses on the Monero blockchain. So that in and of itself, I was like, oh wow, <laughs> that, that is kind of private. So I actually have to open my Monero wallet to pull out the transaction ID, which only Leo and I know. And I plug that into the block explorer and it did bring up the transaction and you know what it told me like almost pretty much a whole lot of nothing right like i don't know leo's address that he sent from it didn't show my address either and it did not even show the exact amount that he tipped us and so i was just kind of blown away by that and turns out people whose whose favorite crypto is not even monero like peter todd for example peter todd tweeted recently that he uses monero to launder his bitcoins like bada bing bada boom useful for all regardless of what your favorite crypto is so thanks leo and thanks monero and the Latin American Bitcoin Conference is coming up in Mexico City on December 4th and 5th. And guess who got press passes? This one and also a cameraman. And we will be there covering it on those days. And so you can look forward to that. I know that I am. And good vibes to the people at Telebit who have been our sponsors this week. I think it's it's a good way to tell the usefulness of something if the person who's hawking it and trying to sell it to you actually uses it themselves. And that's what the Telebit people did when they reached out to us about sponsorship. They paid us using the Telebit bot. And so that's neat. If you would like to learn how to use it on your own Telegram account or just how to use it on your Android device, visit Telebit.org. And speaking of bots, remember to subscribe to the Daily Decrypt so that a Google bot can email you every time we release a video. I love bots. I love robots. Have a good weekend. I believe in miracles. Hey everyone, welcome. Are we having fun at DevCore? This is so, so amazing. Um, one of the things I love about this space is that I just keep learning. Like every single day I learn something new about Bitcoin and at least once a week my mind is blown. So that I had that experience again today listening to some of these presentations. Now I wanted to talk about security today and if you listen to the trolls on Reddit, I don't know anything about security. So I decided instead I'll talk about parenting. Because I don't have any kids. So <laughs> You know, if I'm going to talk about things I don't know, I might as well start there, right? You know, parenting has changed a lot. Um, when I grew up, things were very different. Now, in in the last couple of decades, parenting is completely different. My my sister just had a baby, and uh, I'm watching her as a parent. I'm like a proxy parent as an uncle. It's uh, it's really strange. I'm watching these parents, and um, you know, when I was growing up, Purell didn't exist. Now, it's, it's a miracle we actually made it, right? <laughs> like we survived uh, because apparently there's bacteria everywhere. And uh, today's parenting involves uh, gallon jugs of Purell, right? I've, you watch these parents like um, their kid touches a bit of dirt and they give them a Purell shower right there just to make sure. Not the experience I had, right? I grew up in the 70s. We used to play in the garden, roll around in the mud. We'd make mud cakes. 
Would our parents freak out? No. We'd eat the mud cakes. Would our parents freak out? No. Mostly because they weren't around. They were like, get out of the house, come back when the sun goes down. And so you have to wonder, um, how did we survive without Purell? And recently, if you, if you read some of the studies, you, you hear about this really interesting phenomenon. The rates of asthma and allergy are through the roof. Turns out, if you raise a child in a sterile environment, they don't develop an immune system. Whoops. And so now there's this new round of parenting that is recognizing this fact, and we're going back to our roots. So now we realize that eating mud cakes in the garden is how you build a robust immune system. Right? You don't get allergies, you don't get asthma. And you know, you can take this to the extreme. Um, you have uh, for example, in the, in the third world, um, children don't have extreme allergic reactions to common medications that we have. Why? Because they have even more robust immune systems by being exposed um, to pathogens all of the time, from the moment they're born, before they're born. Um, and then in the other extreme, you have this concept of raising a child in a bubble. Bubble Boy, right? You remember that story? Bubble Boy. It's a tragic story because it's true about a child without an immune system. And there are these um, st strange cases or medical tragedies where um, either children are born with compromised immunity or they lose their immunity through some kind of problem, and then they live in a bubble. And you have to be wondering, what the hell is this guy talking about right now? I thought this was going to be a talk about security and Bitcoin, and here we are. We're talking about bubble boys and eating mud cakes. There's a point to this. Hang on. Hang on. So the reason I'm talking about this is because this has some really important implications in security. You see, if you create a system that is isolated from external influences, then it's not that it doesn't have bugs, it's just that you don't know about the bugs that the system has. And if you create a system that is exposed to external attacks all of the time, it's not that it has a lot of bugs, it's just that you know about the bugs that it has because you keep finding them. And in the process, you fix them, and in the process, the system gets stronger. So this all comes out of a discussion I want to have about an interesting phenomenon we have now, which is this concept of permissioned ledgers and isolated blockchains. Because in my mind, an isolated blockchain is Bubble Boy. Right? It's building a system completely isolated from the world with the hopes that that's going to make it safer. Because banks are like a paranoid helicopter parent that wants to shower their kid in Purell because it touched a booger. And guess what these ledgers are going to get? They're going to get asthma and severe allergies. And the worst case is that eventually the bubble bursts. At some point you get exposed to the outside world. And then you have a scenario where a system that's been isolated for so long has developed no immunity whatsoever gets exposed to some horrific, deadly thing like a pollen particle, <laughs> and dies a horrible death. <laughs> because it has such low immunity that it reacts horribly to something that a properly stimulated, properly raised organism can resist with ease. Now, this isn't the first time we've had this discussion. In fact, ironically, on the internet, this realization that security by isolation and security by obscurity, and security by control and perimeter, and security by trying to tamp down security research fails, and fails miserably. When I was first on the internet in the early 90s, I was talking to banks and telling them why they should get 
email servers and connect to this email thing. And they said many of the same things that I hear in Bitcoin today, which is, well, we don't know anyone who uses email. None of the other banks use email, so who am I going to send email to first place? Secondly, that out there uncontrolled thing might be dangerous. Thirdly, our bankers might say something in email, and how do we add a long disclosure form at the bottom? And what happens if any of our people can communicate with anyone at any moment in time? That's a recipe for chaos, anarchy. Of course, they were right. They just didn't think of chaos and anarchy as a good thing. Uh, many of us in this space probably do. So, what did the banks do with their first uh, attempt to join the internet? What did large corporations do with their first attempt to join the internet? Did they connect TCP/IP systems directly to the internet and build robust applications that could communicate over TCP/IP? No. They built moats and walls and perimeters. They implemented perimeter security. They built firewalls and demilitarized zones, DMZs. And they used all of these military analogies to wall themselves in. And then what did they deploy behind these walls? Did they deploy the common open source protocols and capabilities and applications of the internet? No. They deployed highly denatured, weak equivalents like Outlook and Front Page. And they built um, intranet websites that had stale and obsolete content that was only accessible during working hours through a VPN with no influence from the outside and they said look we're doing internet <laughs> we're so cutting edge we're hip and that's how they did internet they built these highly isolated environments and for a very long time the prevailing idea was that by building these isolated environments, they were more secure. Because they could control things through the firewall. Because they could control access to data, creation of data, access to systems. And now we know that was an illusion. Not only can companies not control these things, but in the process of building these isolated systems, they built Bubble Boy IT. They built IT systems that had no resilience, no immunity. Because Outlook had bugs and front page had bugs. It's just that they weren't tested on the wild internet very often because a lot of the time they lived behind walls. And when we discovered those bugs, it was bad, right? Because eventually someone gets inside the bubble, or the thing that's inside the bubble gets outside the bubble. See the problem with bubbles is that you can't trade through them. And if you're in business, your business is to trade. So if you're a business, you do commerce, and commerce can't happen in a bubble. So the very concept of a bubble is antithetical to commerce. You build your firewall, what's your salesperson going to use on the road? A laptop, which they're going to take outside of the firewall for the very first time, plug it into the hotel internet, contract 72 viruses, and then bring it back into the firewall and give it to everyone else. Bubbles didn't work. On the internet, it didn't work. What are we seeing now? We're seeing a whole generation of companies come to the realization that in order to be nimble and effective, they can't be HP, EMC, Cisco, Oracle, Microsoft, havens of secluded little kingdoms that don't talk to anything else. First of all, because that shit's expensive and it doesn't work. And secondly, because it's incredibly vulnerable. It doesn't have immunity. And so now we see this generation of nimble young startups that are true internet companies. They're products their internal systems, their collaboration, all of it is out there, naked, on the internet. It all happens on GitHub for all the world to see. They use Gmail and collaborate with external email systems all over the world. They're 
Internal systems are external. There is no such thing as internal in the world of the internet. And they're building robust applications because on day one those applications live in the wild and they're more secure. They learn to live out there in the big scary internet and those companies are thriving. And they have systems that are much more secure and much more robust. And that was even before the era of whistleblowers and anonymous who come along and prick these corporate bubbles and get inside and take all of the information and give it out. Now you're probably thinking, well, if permissioned ledgers and closed internets are bubble boy, then the wild internet and Bitcoin are like a kid eating mud cakes, right? A system that has immunity, something exposed to pathogens. Well, almost. That might have been the analogy I wanted to go for, but you know me. I'll go a bit further. Bitcoin isn't the kid that eats mud cakes. Bitcoin is a swarm of sewer rats. <laughs> Gnarly things, missing eyes and claws and tails, like those pigeons you see in Trafalgar Square that are hopping around with this mutant arm stump. <laughs> and what do they eat? What do they eat? They eat raw sewage. They eat your trash. They eat the most virulent things on the planet. There is nothing in this world that has more strength in its immunity system than a New York rat, or a pigeon, or even, God forbid, a squirrel. Those things are horrible. And so, a rat is not going to have allergies. It is not going to sneeze because of a bit of pollen. <laughs> this thing is already carrying three variations of the plague, and it shrugs it off. Because, and that is exactly what Bitcoin is. Malleability? Whew. Attacks? DDoS? Out there in the open. Port 8333, come and get me. And is anybody trying? Hell yes, everyone is trying for six years. The best and the brightest, the meanest and the most malicious are throwing everything they can at this deformed swarm of sewer rats out there, these 6,000 nodes that are listening, and God knows how many other nodes that are exposed to the vagaries of the wild internet, and it survives. So what do the banks do? They're going to build bubble boy blockchains. <laughs> They're going to build permissioned ledgers. Do you think permissioned ledgers suffer from transaction malleability? Hell yes, they do. Do you think altcoins suffer from transaction malleability? Hell yes, they do. They just don't get those things fixed, right? And neither will the permissioned ledgers. And that's just one of the thousands and thousands and thousands of bugs and weaknesses and weird exceptions and edge cases that we're going to find while living out there in the wild and we're going to build this incredibly robust system which is already taking shape today i mean beyond the idea that you could have a decentralized consensus system the idea that that decentralized consensus system could actually survive for six years is kind of ludicrous. And the only reason the banks have now gone to the point of thinking about permissioned ledgers is because they finally reached the stage of bargaining, the third stage in the five stages of grief for the industry they're about to lose. They start with denial. And the basis of denial is, well, this thing isn't going to work. It is going to die any day soon, and it doesn't. And then they say, well, it is just silly money, and it doesn't have any value until it does. And nobody else is going to play with it except that they are. And serious investors won't possibly put money in this except that they did. And it still refuses to die. So we go from denial to bargaining. 
Somewhere in between there might be some anger, there's going to be some depression, and eventually they're going to reach acceptance. But it's going to take a long time. Because if you look at the internet, we're now on maybe 25 years into the internet in terms of really beginning to broaden its use. 25 years in, and there are plenty of companies out there that think that as long as they put their Oracle, EMC, HP, Cisco, Microsoft shit behind a perimeter firewall, all is going to be well. They are still building bubble boys and intranets on the internet. They haven't learned that lesson after 25 years. It's going to take longer in finance. Not only is decentralization, open protocols, open source, collaborative development, and living in the wild a feature of Bitcoin, that's the whole point. And if you take a permission ledger and you say, well, that's all nice, we like the database part of it, can we have it without the open, decentralized, peer-to-peer, -peer, open source, non-controlled, distributed nature of it? Well, you just threw out the baby with the bathwater. You're never going to build a bubble strong enough to keep financial information. Ironically, this is all happening at the same time that as banks have finally gone onto the internet, they're leaking. They're leaking so much from every orifice. They're leaking anonymous, WikiLeaks, insiders. All of that stuff. They don't have confidential transactions. They don't have encrypted this. They don't have privacy. They don't have zero knowledge. They have completely open ledgers. And what do they overlay on top of them? KYC and AML. So they attach identities to everything they're doing, so that when that database gets leaked, it will have a completely rich history not only of every transaction, but of every participant in the system. That's what they're building. They're building panopticons. They're building a panopticon of financial information, and it's leaking. Because the truth of panopticons is when you build a panopticon, it stares back. And when it's the internet that's staring back, that's four billion eyeballs. I'm not so worried about my financial information from my bank leaking. Because maybe a couple hundred people are going to stare back. But when Angela Merkel's phone numbers and phone calls leak, ooh, everybody's staring. Three days ago, the internal presentations and PowerPoints of the Department of Defense about their drone assassination program leaked. Four billion eyes staring back. You built a panopticon? It's staring back. And so the real question we should be asking about permission ledgers is, do you really want to put KYC AML on Bubble Boy? Because you go and add all of that information, when that database leaks four, five, six, ten years into the future, you're going to give anonymous WikiLeaks historians a complete record of every transaction you ever did, the secret slush budget of Lockheed Martin the black budget of your government, the bribes that you paid to depose a democratically elected government, or to install an oil well in a pristine rainforest, all of that shit is going to be on WikiLeaks and all over the internet. And you're going to provide the rich KYC metadata that you painstakingly attach to every transaction. Meanwhile, we're going to build Bitcoin with encrypted anonymous private transactions and you'd better rethink this panopticon you'd better rethink this bubble boy because building resilient systems is about exposing them exposing them to continuous attack that's how you build resilient systems so i'm not scared of permissioned ledgers denatured, defanged, centralized, weak systems behind bubbles. Those are not going to scale, they're not going to survive, they're not going to be secure, they're not going to be provide, they're not going to be providing privacy, and they're going to backfire badly. But the funny thing is, that lesson is going to take a long time to learn. 
I can see it now. Sir, we had all of the drone assassination things behind a firewall, but someone burst through the bubble. All right, call the general. Get me two bubbles. We're going to double up. Bubbles within bubbles. Sir, they burst through our double bubble. Titanium bubbles. If we pay Lockheed Martin a hundred million dollars, maybe they can build us a double titanium bubble that we can hide all of our data behind. Sir, it lasted 30 seconds before Anonymous ripped it to shreds and put all our data on the internet. Hmm. I wonder if we can build more bubbles. They think that having your data on the internet without controlling it centrally is weakness. It isn't weakness. That sewer rat out there isn't weak. It's the strongest thing we can build because it's constantly under attack. And wrapping it in a bubble, it doesn't make it stronger. It gradually denatures and weakens it until what's left is a pale, immunosuppressed little lab rat with red eyes that dies the first time it's exposed to the flu. And so that's what security is. Security is a process. It's a process of openness and exposure. It's a process of continuously adapting to new attacks, and in that process, dynamically becoming more and more robust, less and less fragile. We're introducing Bitcoin in a world full of fragile systems. Central banking, centralized banking, monetary systems that can't manage to achieve liftoff in the economy. In that environment, we're introducing a robust global decentralized system. And it's robust today. It's not perfect. It's got bugs. But we don't hide those bugs. We announce them. We glorify in them. We discuss them. We invite people to attack it. And we take that information and we make it stronger every single day. And that is why we win. Because while they're building Bubble Boy, we're building a swarm of sewer rats. Thank you. So I'm happy to take uh, uh, questions from the audience. We have quite a bit of time, so uh, please go ahead. Andre. Uh, what you're trying to communicate is that um, private blockchains are insecure by design. I, I mean, blockchains that are built within the banks. Okay, I agree with that. But we can take another software uh, that is being used, I mean, uh, as example, like open source projects, okay? so, uh, like HTTP server, let's take uh, Nginx or Apache. It's being used by big corporations like Google, Oracle, whoever, including banks that have a lot of uh, private information. And so what prevents the banks from uh, taking open source grown copy of the Bitcoin code and launching it inside? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, what stops them. I think here's the problem. What happens if you take Apache and you install it in a bank and you put it behind an intranet and you use it internally? I'll tell you what happens. You fall behind on the patches. You stop doing vulnerability tests. You stop exposing it to external vulnerability tests that you didn't order, that just came your way. Okay, so the and as you do that, it gets denatured. It gets weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker until eventually you're running Apache, but it's three versions behind. It's vulnerable to anything, and someone comes in, pricks through the bubble, breaks through the perimeter, and takes that Apache for a ride. Um, and that's because you weren't under pressure to live in the wild. And when the pressure goes away, so do the standards. I would be happy to see Bitcoin as. A the one world currency, and you probably know that I've also been working towards this direction during the last five years or so. But meanwhile, we have big banks and corporations uh, existing within the countries. And Google is a good example of like using a lot of open source software and using it properly, right? Do you agree with that? 
Yes, so and most of their stuff this... runs pretty much out there. So it while uh, this, uh, in, while we have not yet shifted to like completely decentralized anarchist like picture of world with only one currency, we will have the banks and uh, Bitcoin solves some problem for them. I mean, private blockchain solves uh, problem of synchronizing synchronizing transactions between the branches, like not losing transactions and so on. So they they have a choice either to like not solve this problem or try to apply this uh, solution? They have a lot more choices than that. I mean, just today, Greg was talking about Liquid, which is a sidechain for doing exactly that between exchanges. Now, where are exchanges today? Today, they run a MySQL database that stores entries for the account value of every customer. We saw what happened with Willybot and Gox with that particular issue. right? This is an incremental improvement. Now, how does that differ from a permissioned ledger? Well, the main difference is that if you think Citibank is going to run their permissioned ledger on internet connected machines and open to everyone to scrutinize, you're sorely mistaken. What they're going to do is they're going to hide it behind a tall wall and they're going to run it among their five, six, seven, eight bankly friends. Um, and what that's going to do is it's going to mean that that software is going to be weak and it's going to get weaker because all of the lessons we're learning in the wild won't get applied there until a whistleblower runs a little Trojan and malleates the transactions of their running exchange and uh, then they're going to have a bit of a problem. Okay, I got your idea. What I was trying to say is that as long as big institutions still exist, they will h hold some amount of private information inevitably about their customers, right? And they, since blockchain solves some problem for them, they will, they will be using it. And they really have a choice to either use open source developments like launch a copy of Ethereum within their network or try to build something known. Uh, so we'll have a two like worlds of uh, blockchains again like commercial blockchains built by Microsoft and open source blockchains built by open source community and both will be used by large organizations it's not like yeah absolutely i mean we are going to live in a thank you we are going to live in a world with a lot of diversity we are going to have completely closed systems that are permissioned ledgers that have so little decentralization functionality that effectively all they are is three-phase commit on top of a database with audit logs. And instead of having audit logs in a log file, they have audit logs based on Merkle trees and hashes. So that's not innovation. That's 20-year-old technology um, applied in a slight twist to what they're doing now. And on the other end of the scale, you're going to have completely open systems, open source systems, you're going to have sophisticated cryptography, and we're mostly going to be living on that end. Now, if that's the environment and that's the competitive landscape, um, that's great. <laughs> I mean, uh, because that's an environment in which not only can we win with Bitcoin and with other technology, or rather, it's not a matter of winning. It's a matter of building robust solutions that have use and value for people all around the world that change the world. That's something we can do. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm not worried about competing against the Microsoft blockchain. You know, you described uh, Bitcoin as an army of sewer rats. But I'm going to disagree. I think our, uh, Bitcoin is a single sewer rat, um, and uh, because of that, it's vulnerable. The sewer rat is named Bitcoin Core. Um, if we really want to be a army of uh, sewer rats, we have to have more implementations so that if one rat dies, the army remains. You know, um, I don't think you will find a single core developer who will ratify the idea that the best approach is to have only one implementation. I think the real difference is that implementing more than one implementation and creating software diversity on a consensus sensitive system is something that's never been done before and it's bloody difficult because you have totally one agree. bug and you get the uh, May 2013 26 block fork because of Berkeley DB which wasn't even part of the consensus rules. I think if you look at the development roadmap of Bitcoin Core, you'll see that there is an enormous effort underway with libconsensus and libsep 256k um, to, to modularize and isolate the elements that are consensus important, and to make those available for libraries for other implementations. And there are other implementations. 
year six is a toddler, right? And so already there are three or four competing implementations that are fairly good uh, and are able to keep up in, in some ways. Um, is it still uh, very much a monoculture? Yes, uh, we still have some biodiversity issues. Um, but I don't think anybody wants that. It's just they recognize that it's very difficult to uh, move away from that in a system that is consensus critical. Okay, question, Michael. Um, how much of it is a question of competence? I mean, looking at operating systems, iOS is a lot more secure than Android, and that that kind of breaks down your analogy. I don't think it's a matter of competence. I think well. It depends on how you define competence. Um, if, you if you think of competence simply as an internal and intrinsic attribute of a single person, then perhaps, but competence isn't to me an attribute of a single person. It's an emergent aspect of a team or collaborative behavior. Right? Competence is not you writing code alone. Uh, very few people can exhibit competence across scale and time um, as coders. Competence and quality of code is something that emerges from the collaboration of many people because the area that I have competence in is different from the area that you have competence in and if we're sharing Then there will be someone out there who will notice the one thing that I missed um, and so I don't think that's really the case. I think What is the issue with Android? I think the the fundamental difference between Android and iPhone is not about code quality um, or security of the underlying code. It's about the difference that iPhone runs on 20, 25 different platforms, if you take all of the versions of iPhones that exist out there. And Android runs on 500 different platforms by different manufacturers, all of which create subtle variations. It's a matter of um, uncontrolled diversity in a system. And there is Android that is extremely good, and there is Android that is extremely bad, whereas with iPhone, it's a much narrower band of higher quality. That's a specific choice to align hardware, software, quality control services under a single umbrella, and that works in some cases, but it also slows down innovation. And how do I know that? I know that because I had a Bitcoin wallet a year and a half on my Android before it was available on iOS. And that's a perfect example of how it slows down innovation. Wall gardens mini bubbles, uh, they reduce your ability to trade outside the bubble. And so you pay a heavy price for that. Uh, and over longer scales of time, that price may be insurmountable. I, I love the, um, the sewer rat analogy. Um, that's awesome. And the helicopter parent, that's equally awesome. Still trying to wrap my head around how the sewer rats see the helicopter parents and how they relate to them and whether they ignore them completely and um, they live and, under and go the about grip. their business. Um, the, uh, it seems like the common element of, of these uh, semi-cooperative um, entities um, and rats don't really collaborate and helicopter yeah, I parents mean, uh, listen, I'm, I'm not gonna make somewhat a... collaborate but okay. Let's not attempt to do a formal proof on yeah, the internal yeah. <laughs> consistency of my analogies. I can tell you right now... I'm, I'm just saying I, I, I love it. I'm going deep on it. So, <laughs> The point <laughs> is I, not I about the about specific this biology of the rat. Uh, the point is about the difference between uh, robustness in an environment with stimulus versus uh, weakness in an environment that lacks stimulus or has isolation. Mm -hmm. And so... Use whatever analogies you want. I thought that starting a title of a presentation with Bubble Boy and the Bitcoin Sewer Rat, as I announced on Twitter last week, would at least bring some people th here thinking, what the hell? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but in addition, I think that control is, is the medium that, that uh, or the perception of control is the medium between perception the two of, of and, control. And when you, when you said rats, I immediately thought of Pizza Rat in the New York subway system and... and yeah, and well, the helicopter parents like pizza too, so maybe pizza is the control. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> control is going to be a big issue with these permission ledgers. The illusion of control or the use of hierarchy, authority, and control 
in order to effectively change the future. Uh, that's an illusion that all of us can fall into, right? right? The, the assumption that uh, we control our, our destiny and that if only we control a few more variables, we'll have control. That's what drives people crazy, like if you want to be neurotic. Now, if we wanted to make the analogy that many large corporations are institutionally neurotic, I'm all with you, because effectively that's what that element of control is. That being terrified to open yourself up to the outside world because you are a hierarchical institution, that has authority and control in its very DNA, and that being a fundamental and perhaps extinction-level weakness of large hierarchical organizations, I'm with you there, because that is the end result of this. It is an issue of control. Yeah, we're not infected. All right, let's take one more question here. I think maybe we have a bit more time. Go for Great, it. thanks a lot. Um, also, I agree with everybody. Cool analogies, but I, I just would love to hear your thoughts about um, whether Bitcoin has actually been attacked in all the ways um, or in the most effective ways. Because one thing that makes sense to me, as you know, if I, for example, had an attack that was very effective, right? I wouldn't use it now when I can't profit from it. I would wait until I could profit from it, namely when a short market appeared where if I successfully executed the attack, I would make $10 million, $20 million, you know, any millions of dollars. So I'm just not, I, I, I get the analogy and what you're saying makes sense compared to distributed ledgers. I'm just wondering on your perspective of what happens when much more economic incentive via short markets appears for somebody who might have an attack to actually use it. That's, that's a really good point. And I, I think we should recognize, and let's be realistic here, Bitcoin has not been attacked in every way possible, and as much as it possibly can yet. And it certainly wasn't in the early days. Bitcoin had one unique advantage, which was this two plus year honeymoon period when nobody thought it was important or relevant or even would work. Um, if at that time people had attacked it, it was it was much weaker, right? There were some horrific bugs in the early days, right? Um, and there are plenty of core developers here who can talk about some of the hilarious things, like for example, being able to create Coinbase with billions and billions of bitcoins in them. Oops. Um, you know, some of the validation rules slipped through blocks that had infinite coins in them, um, and, and many other bugs. We got a honeymoon period then to fix the most egregious bugs, and we still have a honeymoon period now because here's the hilarious thing: most of these banks, most of these large organizations in finance, most of the central banks, they look at Bitcoin the way Walmart looks at a lemonade stand. And they are still laughing, which is great. I hope they keep doing that for two more years, three more years. Give us a bit more of a honeymoon period so we can get even more robust. Because we really don't need concerted attacks right now. Although, from another perspective, I would rather have some of the attacks materialize now, before we have mass adoption and a lot of users being disrupted. But this is a, this is a continuous process in a race. The real issue here is the time scale. Right? And the interesting implication what we're saying here has is that a lot of altcoins don't get that grace period anymore, which is why it's a lot harder to build robust altcoins because one, you don't get a grace period on mining. If anybody thinks it's going to be valuable, they're there. Uh, so it's not just like nobody noticed. And you don't get a grace period on security anymore. So if you've implemented things sloppily, someone's going to find it. In fact, just the other day, I, I was reading this fantastic article about 42 coin. Are you familiar with 42 coin? It's, a, it's an altcoin that was designed uh, to only ever have 42 coins. It currently has 48. <laughs> it would have taken two lines of code to constrain the mining algorithm so that after the initial process of mining the first 42 coins as promised, it stopped. 
And in fact, several people noticed that this was missing from the code, and they wrote to the developer who had since abandoned the project. And so nobody patched it, nobody upgraded these systems because they were really running in an isolated environment and not really participating in a real economy. So nobody fixed them, and then coin 43 was mined. And at that point, you have an existential crisis for this altcoin because it's no longer a 42 coin. Um, this is going to keep happening, and it happens because there's not enough people interested in fixing the bugs. Um, you know, this is the other, uh, the flip side of this idea. It's really hilarious to me when you talk to companies and you say, "Hey, how about you open source your code?" And they say, "Oh my God, if we do that, people are going to see it, and they might use it without paying us." And the hardest thing to explain to a company that's doing software is you wish people would see it and use it. Most likely, if you open source your code, like the other 700,000 projects on GitHub, no one will give a shit, and no one will use it, and you will not create a community. If you actually manage to get people to see it, use it, and create a developer community around it, congratulations, you are in the 1% of projects that have achieved that. It is a rare and difficult achievement. And in fact, Bitcoin has succeeded more in that than any of the altcoins, or, to go back to my previous analogy, any of the permission ledgers would ever hope to have when they close themselves down from external scrutiny. Do you want to pass it to the person next to you, please? Thank you. Okay, um, so I really like sewer rats too, and I see them in New York City screwing around the subway. And maybe they could survive a nuclear apocalypse or something more than the bankers up above, but they're also living in muck and dirt in these little small passageways while the bankers up above have huge buildings and they could they have also have a lot of power and they could go live in Bermuda. Their bubbles give them a lot of ability. I'd like Bitcoin to have a lot of power too. How do the sewer rats get power? Well, here's the funny thing. Six hundred and fifty million years ago. There was a big lizard species, or a series of big lizard species on this planet. And they were big, and they were proud. And they tromped around, and they stomped around. And they usually stopped on, on little furry mammals that were scurrying among the tree trunks below them. They didn't pay much attention to them, but guess what? They died, and the little furry things became us, and we won. So don't underestimate the little furry mammal among the trees because someday meteors happen. Um, and here's the thing: when the dinosaurs see the meteor, they go through the same process of the bank seeing Bitcoin. They look up and they go, "Well, that's not happening. That can be real." And then they start screaming at it. So to me, the banks at the moment dealing with Bitcoin, the ones that have begun to realize what is happening, are now braying at the meteors, trying to make them stop falling on their head. And you can't really do that. Um, don't underestimate the tiny, scrappy, little incumbent, uh, the little uh, competitor, scurrying around the tree trunks, because eventually they become the dominant species. And remember where and how the internet developed in the beginning. Because I went into phone companies and did presentations explaining to them why they needed to address and understand and adapt to the threat of decentralized communications. We didn't call it that then, but TCP/IP. And do you know what they did? They laughed. They laughed at the internet. These massive companies like AT&T. And in my case, I went to the Greek national phone company, OTE. It doesn't really exist anymore. It fell apart. But um, they laughed at the idea of the internet, because the idea that through this messy process of decentralized routing, where you drop packets all the time, that's not a bug, that's a feature, dropping packets, it's messy, it's nasty, that this could actually compete with these carefully constructed hierarchical systems of these global spanning copper 
and increasingly digital networks. It was completely laughable. They went off and designed ISDN and said, huh, better than the internet, it can do video conferencing. The internet can't scale to do video conferencing or voice or any of those things. Fast forward 20 years, now they're running their entire voice network on top of the internet. Things change much faster than we anticipate, and this, the power and scalability of decentralized systems, and the robustness of systems that initially appear to be messy and sloppy, like the internet was, uh, can often surprise. But what doesn't or shouldn't surprise you is the hubris of those who think that the little scrappy competitor won't amount to much. All right, I'll take uh, one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. Thank you. There you go. Uh, Alan Turing and Enigma um, demonstrated that um, no form of uh, cryptography, any form of cryptography can eventually br be broken all through history when you had Navajo and you know, various types of cryptography. There was always something that no, nobody imagined that would crack it. Um, do you believe that to be true or not? Yeah, absolutely. All forms of cryptography can be broken. All so forms of cryptography are eventually broken. That is a truism. Including that behind Bitcoin? Including that currently behind Bitcoin, yes. The question again is time scale. You see, the real secret of the enigma was the secret of the broken enigma. The reason uh, Bletchley Park was successful in essentially winning World War II, at least for the North Sea and the British forces, um, was because they managed to hide the secret of breaking Enigma. Because what would have happened if the secret that they broke Enigma leaked? Enigma would have been improved and changed, and the damage that they had managed to cause, which at that point was complete and systemic capture of all of the cryptographic communications of the Germans, would have been contained. And so they would only be able to capture the Enigma machines that hadn't yet upgraded. Isolation was the downfall of that system, because by definition it had to be isolated. So the lesson we need to learn is we expect cryptography to be broken. We expect every system and subsystem within Bitcoin eventually to be weakened. And what we need to do is one, make sure that any such weaknesses are not systemic and complete, and then identify the weaknesses early enough to start addressing them so that they don't become systemic. And the best way you do that is by existing in an open, collaborative environment where you learn about those weaknesses. If ECDSA gets hacked today, or becomes weak today, what does that mean? Does that mean that every person in the world can suddenly crack ECDSA at any scale? No. It will mean that for a certain class of very well-funded attackers, certain types of ECDSA with an enormous effort can be cracked. At which point, our friend Greg back there will be building a side chain that doesn't use SEP. 256k1, <laughs> SecP 256k1. In fact, the example of the Schnorr signatures implementation on uh, Elements Alpha already shows you the possibility of having a Bitcoin subsystem that allows for a variety of uh, signature technologies to be used within the Bitcoin ecosystem. There's no reason why we all need to use ECDSA. We can add a patch to the system that recognizes, um, let's say. Uh, Apple's curve that they use, I don't remember what it's called, it's a long number, um, or that uses a completely different cryptographic system. Uh, I'd probably select something um, created, verified, audited by Bruce Schneier. <laughs> but uh, the bottom line is that you could create, in fact, an ecosystem where you don't rely on any single curve, and therefore the system is robust because every customer can pick which curve they want to use or which signing system they want to use, so that even if one of them was compromised, it only compromises a subset. That's possible to do today. The real question we need to ask is, like two weeks ago, SHA-1 was shown to be weak. Eventually, SHA-256 is going to be weak, and at that point, um, we had better have reached the point in the curve where fees matter more than rewards. Otherwise, the consensus mechanism won't let us upgrade. 
Um, but there are always weaknesses. No cryptographic system lasts forever, which is why you don't want to bake it into a permission ledger behind a wall that nobody ever inspects, maintains, or updates, um, because then it's going to become weak. And in fact, those systems are going to become monocultures. They will lack security biodiversity, to use a to use the term strangely, but they will lack the diversity required. Bitcoin is not very diverse today, but it is getting more diverse, and will continue to get more diverse and more robust. All right, thank you all. Uh, appreciate your time, and uh, thanks so much for coming.